250,000 miles of stone wall. 250,000 miles. That is more stone wall than there is railroad track in this country. It is more stone wall by a long way than the entire length of the U.S. coastline. It is enough stone wall, in fact, to go all the way around the world ten times. It's, oh, you're not impressed by that? It's even enough stone wall. This is the last statistic. <laughs> to stretch from the parking lot outside this lovely building to the surface of the moon. There are two notable things about this number. The first one is that it is wrong. It's too low, by a long way. That is because the federal report on fencing only described what it said it was going to describe, which was barriers between sections of farmlands or fences. Anybody who's been in New England for more than about 15 minutes knows that there are a great many more things here in New England built out of what we call dry laid stone, that is to say stone structures that are held together by nothing more than their own weight and the skill of the person who puts them there. Many more things built this way than merely fences. They include ramps and causeways and stone-lined wells and the old town pounds and, of course, thousands and thousands of foundations of their houses and barns and buildings of all kinds. Taken together with the straightforward 250,000 miles plus of dry laid stone fence, it has been estimated by some people who perhaps became a little too excited by this number that there is more dry laid stone in the Northeast United States than there is in the entire rest of the world combined. This is not an assertion I am personally prepared to back up. But I would say that simply the fact that somebody <coughs> made this observation should give you some idea of the almost incredible communal architectural accomplishment that these walls and other structures represent. Second notable thing about this 250,000 mile number really doesn't have much to do with the number itself, but rather with the year that it was arrived at. Because if you could pick a year in which we reached a kind of tipping point here in New England, it began to lose more stone wall than we were gaining. 
You could do much, much worse than fetch up on 1871. By that time, a kind of combination of events that had been developing throughout the 19th century came to a head, if you will, to put an end to the long period that had preceded it, uh, in which so many people on the small freehold farms of New England uh, were engaged in one way or another, gathering stone, transporting it from one place to another, uh, or assembling it into structures. These events included the Civil War, uh, which of course took lots and lots of farmers off the land, sent them off to fight. Quite a few of them did not return. Uh, however, among those who did, the effect was probably even more profound, uh, because many of them learned during the course of their travels in the army that there are places in this country where the topsoil is six feet deep, not six inches deep, and therefore, quite a few of them came home only long enough to put their families and their tools into a wagon and head off for Ohio or Missouri or the upper Midwest or some place where farming seemed a little bit less like an act of desperation or insanity. This was the beginning uh, of the great outmigration of farming families from New England that began in some areas even before the Civil War, uh, but certainly accelerated massively at the end of the Civil War. But that was not the only reason we began to slow down and then eventually stop building new stone walls. The Industrial Revolution had a great deal to do with it as well. First, with its uh, revolutionizing of tr uh, transportation, with of course the uh, canals and then the railroads. Uh, this opened up New England to competition from Western farms. And when I say Western farms in this context, I'm talking about upstate New York. Uh, and the Ohio uh, River Valley, uh, not the uh, West as we conceive it today. Uh, but that uh, competition from farms on better land uh, to the west of here uh, was not very good for New England. We uh, uh, were not able to uh, compete nearly as well uh, once that uh, began to happen. Uh, but perhaps the uh, uh, most profound effect the Industrial Revolution had uh, was its mechanization, uh, mechanization, if you will, uh, of agriculture. It's bears talking about it just a minute uh, or two. You know, the model that was brought here by European farmers at the beginning of the 17th century was a model that held that small fields produced best. This was because all work was done by hand. Now imagine yourself, perhaps, um, uh, mowing hay on one of these tiny little medieval style fields. When farmers came into these areas and began to break down the forest and turn it into farmland, they tended to break it into small acreages of two to three to five acres. Uh, this was uh, to accommodate the handwork that most uh, uh, farmers relied on exclusively. Uh, and so imagine yourself mowing hay, for instance, on a tiny little three acre parcel that's nicely bounded by old stone walls. Well, if you are mowing with a scythe, you could literally step right up to the edges of those walls, can't you? cut every blade of grass in the place. But by the end of the 19th century, a great many farmers were no longer cutting their hay that way. Instead, they were dragging a six or an eight foot cutter bar behind a team of horses or oxen. Now, when you're dragging a machine and a, 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 of any kind, a cutter bar or anything else, you have to start turning about 20 feet before every corner. So, in order to get the machine and the team around. So, um, Quite a few of these farmers, toward the end of the century, found themselves digging large trenches beside old stone walls that in many cases had been built by them, uh, their fathers, grandfathers, or perhaps even partly by themselves, dumping the walls into them and burying them just below the surface of the ground in order to enlarge their fields uh, and make them more responsive uh, to the new machine agriculture. Uh, and so it was the discovery of the farmers that stone walls, which had once been uh, their friend in taming the land, uh, were now not nearly so useful uh, as they had once been. This, again, was not the only reason we stopped uh, building them. The invention of barbed wire, which happened to occur uh, in 1868, just a few years before this federal report on fencing was compiled, uh, had something to do with it as well. The death of the sheep industry, which had been such a mainstay uh, for so long uh, for New England farmers, uh, and took away their main source of income as far as livestock goes. All of these things combined uh, to uh, cause stone walls to become more of an impediment than a help. Uh, that is why we began uh, to lose them. Well, how did we get all these walls in the first place? You know, it may surprise you a little bit because uh, the network of walls and other structures is so extensive all over New England uh, that it is an assumption of many of us 
uh, that these walls must have been built up laboriously over many, many years of difficult labor. Uh, but the truth is that historically speaking, we acquired our stone wall network in a remarkably short period of time. One estimate uh, says that the bulk of them on a volume basis was completed uh, in about a 50-year period, between about 1775 and 1825. This is not to say uh, that no walls were built before these dates, uh, and certainly none, uh, or, uh, or after them. Of course, many, many were. Uh, only that there was an intense period uh, in the immediate uh, aftermath of the revolution uh, as we began to be able to get back to farming uh, without the necessity of fighting a war on our own soil. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we acquired huge amounts of stone wall uh, in those very productive post-revolutionary years. Uh, then an event occurred at the beginning of the 19th century which vastly accelerated the building of stone walls. This was the arrival of the first breeding pairs of merino sheep uh, in our part of the country. The instant these sheep appeared in New England, they became the primary agricultural animal for many, many farmers. We literally raised millions of them over the next 30 or 40 years. They did so well here that they made a great many farmers rich. Uh, and this produced really the only sustained period of agricultural prosperity uh, that New England ever enjoyed. It also obligated farmers to enclose additional thousands of acres uh, of land in fencing of one kind or another. By the time those sheep came along, stone walls had become established uh, as the traditional New England method uh, of fencing in land. This also had an effect on the building of walls because having to enclose so much land uh, so quickly, uh, the farmers found that they could not keep up with uh, uh, the demands of this work and still maintain their own farms. And so we begin to see gangs of men moving around the countryside, making deals with farmers to build such and such an amount of wall uh, for such and such a price. Uh, this, of course, sped up the uh, building of walls in general throughout the area. Well, the sheep industry lasted uh, for about 35 years or so. Uh, it began to run out of steam around the 1840s. Uh, had a little boost because of the need for <coughs> wool for uniforms uh, in the run-up to the Civil War, but then began uh, uh, to uh, tank big time, if you will, uh, in the aftermath uh, of that war. It was competition from the West that did it, but we also had bank failures and the standard issue uh, troubles of the uh, farmer. Um, there were tariff issues, does that sound familiar? Uh, and eventually uh, the industry began to slow down uh, and move to other parts of the country. And this precipitated the great out-migration from many, many New England towns. We began to lose serious amounts of population, especially out of upland areas uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War. In fact, uh, the, the loss of population in uh, many of these areas was so profound uh, that the uh, governments of New England began to uh, worry about it, about the entire uh, region being abandoned <laughs> Uh, many, many farmers simply walked away from their land uh, and uh, disappeared for parts unknown. Some of them went to work in the factories. Uh, others moved out west. Uh, there are, as a result of this, quite a few towns here in New Hampshire, but also uh, throughout New England, which have not to this day managed to return to the populations that they had in 1830, which we can take as the peak period. Uh, for the success, uh, uh, in general, of small-scale uh, New England subsistence agriculture. Uh, my example for this is the town of Lyme, which is over uh, by Hanover, if you don't uh, know where it is, in the upper valley. The town of Lyme has about uh, uh, something along the lines of uh, nine to 1,100 people uh, in it now, but in 1830 it had more than 1,500. Uh, this is because the entire eastern uh, uh, side of the town uh, is at an elevation above 1,100 feet. And so, uh, on those rocky hilltops, there was nothing you could really do farm-wise uh, except raise sheep. So when that industry uh, uh, disappeared from uh, New England, so did all the farmers who lived up there. Everybody uh, who lives in Lyme now is down by the river, clustered in the village, and that whole uh, eastern side of town, which had a much higher elevation, uh, 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 became virtually abandoned. The truth is that in the old days, even though there are many more people now than there were uh, in those days, we lived on the land quite differently.
we tended to be evenly spread across the surface of our towns rather than clustered in places uh, like cities and towns and of course uh, uh, the villages that function as the political centers of those towns. Uh, and so uh, with people scattered all over the town, it was possible for a little place like Lyme uh, to have a bigger population in 1830 than it has right now. And this is not the only town uh, that suffered from this. New England as a whole began to sink into a kind of permanent recession in the aftermath of the Civil War. And this recession lasted for us all the way up into the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, it has been said, uh, for instance, that the Depression was good for New England. Well, my own parents who lived through it here uh, would not take that view. Uh, but I will say one thing about the Depression. It did drag the rest of the country down into the hole where we had already been living for 40 <laughs> years when it came along, thus evening the playing field a little bit uh, and making it possible for us to bounce back. And a great many segments of the New England economy, uh, not the least of which is the, our uh, uh, claim that it's a wonderful place to live and people here are honest and hardworking and good neighbors uh, and uh, that this is a healthy place uh, and a sensible place uh, to raise your family. All of those things got their start uh, in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, industries that are now quite important to our economy such as the uh, ski industry, the summer theater industry, all kinds of uh, vacation oriented or uh, uh, heritage uh, tourism uh, things began to appear uh, during the middle of the Great Depression. Well, why am I talking about this in a lecture ostensibly devoted to stone walls? Because that long, fallow period when we seem to have lost all our um, uh, cultural and economic zip acted in the end as a kind of preservative for many aspects of the old agricultural <coughs> infrastructure that had been left behind by previous generations of farmers. And so, uh, and with respect to stone walls, uh, it meant that uh, a great deal more of the antique work, the old work in the walls and the other structures, the town pounds, etc., was left in place because so little new development came along to displace it. Uh, this uh, turned out in the end uh, to be uh, very, very nice for some of the antique uh, stone work, especially uh, that it still remains, uh, even in a deteriorated condition, uh, uh, to instruct and amaze us uh, still. Well, how these walls put together. There is, for you Star Trek fans, a prime directive in stone wall building. It is this. If you're going to put a dry laid stone structure together, you'd like it to stay together for a little while, because contrary to the mythology of New England stone walls, every single one of them falls down sooner or later. So your objective when you build one is to build something that's going to fall down later, <laughs> not sooner. You do this by following the prime directive, which can be stated in several ways, but perhaps the most widely known one is that you must place one stone over two, or two over one. In other words, cross-hatch the layers or courses of stone row by row over the joints of the stones in the layer below, rather than stacking stones up directly on top of one another. This is called, oddly enough, stack bonding. The reason it is bad is because it segregates the wall into separate structural sections that can then come apart much more easily over time. Well, what does that mean? I mean, these are stones, right? They don't have legs. They're not trying to get away. Or are they? <laughs> The fact is that every stone in the world has an ambition, a personal ambition, to sink to the center of the earth as soon as possible. It's extraordinarily patient about waiting for an opportunity to fulfill this ambition, and when it gets one, it accepts immediately. We do have earthquakes in our part of the world from time to time. They're not very spectacular by California standards, but they're enough. And many, many other things attack stone walls, almost from the instant that they are laid down. They include changes in the way that water is moving under the wall, uh, uneven compression from one part of the wall to another, which results in vertical splits opening up in the structure as a whole, uh, the growth of tree roots underneath them from trees that are growing too close to them that uh, spill them upward from below, catastrophic events such as floods and hurricanes uh, that create uh, enormous uh, erosion events uh, or uh, tear trees down uh, whose uh, root falls when they rip up.
uh, tear down, uh, 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 explode underneath the wall and, and start to tear it down. Uh, but any kind of uh, uh, shaking uh, also has something to do uh, with the eventual deterioration of stone walls as well. Now, most of the earthquakes that we have around here are pretty uh, tame by, uh, uh, by real earthquake standards. They tend to be in the 2.9 or 1.3 uh, category. Uh, uh, is so light that you don't even know they happened until you read about them in the paper the next day. Now, about 10 years ago, we had a, a, a fairly serious one for us. It was over on the, some of you may remember this, it was over on the main border in the town of Sanford, a massive 4.0. When that earthquake came across the countryside, every single stone and every wall said to itself, hey, here's my chance. <laughs> I can get a little closer to the center of the earth, and if there was any space around that stone within the structure that it occupied, it slipped or slid or otherwise contrived to get itself into that space and begin to fulfill its ambition. This is why stone walls are like people. They tend to loosen up and spread out as they get into <laughs> And eventually, uh, to fall apart completely in spite of their best efforts not to do so. The way to resist this is to cross hatch stones within the wall, not just in the visible parts of the wall, which accounts for the 2 over 1, 1 over 2 rule, uh, but also in the interior wall uh, of the wall, so that each stone in the wall is touching as many other stones as possible. Uh, this means that they have multiple physical dependencies for holding their position over time, not just one. Uh, and that redistributes weight and pressure throughout the structure in a way that tends to tighten up in a well-built wall uh, over time, rather than loosening up. Uh, and so uh, walls can contribute to their own longevity uh, if they are properly built uh, in the first place. Well, <coughs> he's getting closer. Yeah. <laughs> As our uh, 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 forebears uh, learned when they first began to build these walls, uh, there are some things about New England stone wall building that are quite different from what we see in the rest uh, of the stone wall world. You know, in most parts of the world where people build uh, a lot of stone walls, uh, they built um, uh, the stone supply, the available supply of uh, material is relatively homogeneous with respect to its array of shapes and sizes. In other words, if you're in the Lake District of, of England, uh, or even in parts of this country, for instance, down in the uh, Kentucky-Virginia-Tennessee Triangle, which is a great hotbed of stone wall building, one stone looks a lot like another. Uh, that makes their uh, building structures out of them uh, a little bit easier because the rules stay the same from stone to stone. This is not true, however, in New England. Here in New England, we have a, an enormous mess of every single shape and size you could possibly imagine, from a ping pong ball to a Volkswagen bus, all mixed up in a, uh, an ungodly, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, an ungodly mess that uh, uh, made it absolutely impossible uh, for our early farmers to do anything coherent uh, with farming until they cleared them off that land. One of the reasons that we got so much stone wall uh, so quickly, uh, by the way, uh, was a, a bit of an ironic one. Because the first choice for fencing for uh, uh, our very early settlers, those in the uh, late 17th and early 18th century, was not stone. It was the great mess that you get when you have to cut down thousands of acres of virgin forest. And so our earliest fences, far from being made of stone, made of split rails uh, and pulled stumps set up in great forbidding rows. But at the same time, they were creating these early settlement days of uh, organic fencing. Uh, they also found themselves obligated to move enormous amounts of surface stone off the uh, land in order to be able to plow or plant or really do much of anything on the surface of it. Once they had done that, they tended to take that uh, waste stone, as they thought of it, out to the edges of their fields and throw it up against the or organic fencing, the uh, stumps and split rails. Well, of course, being organic, that uh, material tended to break down over time and rot away. Uh, and at the same time that this was happening, uh, they uh, began to complete the clearing uh, in the areas where they lived. And so uh, the materials from which they made these types of fences 
uh, were no longer nearly as available as they had been before. That meant that they began to simply reorganize these long, low, rounded mounds of stone that they had thrown up against their, uh, uh, their early fencing. Uh, and so because so much of that stone was lying along the fence lines when they began to build the walls, that contributed very much to the, uh, uh, the speed with how much we acquired uh, of them in such a short uh, historical time. One of the things that's uh, also different about New England stone wall building is the motivation of the people who did it. You know, in most parts of the world, when they build a, a stone wall, they do it because they want a wall. That's sensible. Here in New England, we did it for that reason, of course. Uh, but we also did it because we needed to get rid of as much stone as possible. This had an enormous effect on the way our stone walls look. They are, in general, bigger, thicker, taller, heavier uh, than what we see in many, many other parts uh, of the world. And this is because uh, our earliest builders discovered that uh, by making them that way, by making them thicker and wider, uh, they created interior space in these walls in which all the crazy shapes that don't like to play well with others uh, could be stowed away uh, and contribute to, the, uh, uh, contribute to the wall as a whole, uh, but not disrupt its uh, structural integrity uh, because of their uh, crazy shapes. The differences in uh, New England stone from place to place as well are quite very wide. You can find lots of spots where most of the stone in any given area is all rounded and worn by the glaciers. Uh, you can find other places where much of the stone is uh, very small, uh, others where it's very large and rounded over. Uh, sometimes it's broken and shattered. And this also has an effect on the way our walls look. It convinces some people, for instance, that there are many types of New England walls. In fact, there are only two. From, uh, in structural terms, they are the freestanding wall, uh, which rises into space and shows what we call faces on both sides, uh, and the retaining wall, uh, which rises into space on only one side uh, and marks the difference between two grades of different height. The principal difference between these two types of walls uh, in structural terms is the mathematical relationship of width to height. Stone walls must have a certain amount of mass in order to hold themselves together over time. This is so the pressing down of great weight from the upper courses of, this, of the wall uh, on the lower ones, the ones that are in contact with the ground, uh, is necessary to keep them from moving around too much under the assault of different things that begins to happen to them uh, from the moment they are first uh, constructed. A wall that is too thin, too narrow for the height it's trying to reach will come apart much, much more easily uh, under this assault uh, than will one uh, which is thick enough to generate uh, the weight that is needed to press it down uh, on its lower courses. For uh, freestanding walls, this uh, seems to break down to a, a working formula. It's not one you're going to find in a book anywhere, uh, uh, but it is one that seems to have uh, been applied uh, across the board in many kinds of buildings. This formula for freestanding walls is a, uh, a relationship of about three quarters to one. What that means is that if you're proposing to build a six-foot-tall freestanding wall, then you've got to begin with a footprint. Um, that is to say, the part of the wall that's touching the ground of uh, at least four feet, three-quarters of that six-foot height, or else your wall will not have enough mass or weight to hold itself together over time. For retaining walls, the formula is even stricter. It begins at one-to-one one and goes up from there. My family and I took up. Uh, took a part in an old carriage house foundation one year that had been uh, bearing up a very large building. Uh, this carriage house uh, foundation had eight foot tall walls in its cellar. Now many, many foundations uh, in New England are uh, retaining walls. That is because we back those buildings up into higher slopes in order to bury the lower course, uh, bury the lower story, uh, and yet give ourselves access to it by leaving one side of the long building open. Uh, in order to get wagons and animals in there. What we found uh, when we took that wall apart was that behind these eight foot tall foundation walls, uh, visible in the cellar, was more than 12 feet, 12 feet of carefully laid stone running back from the hillside. This is one to one and a half, more than four times the bulk that you would have needed in order to create a similar freestanding wall. But this was built in the uh, absolutely classic New England retaining wall style, which is to say that the back side, the side you can't see, was not built straight up, but was rather bent over into a 45 degree hypotenuse, 
so that it stepped up from that 12-foot base uh, uh, roughly to about an 18-inch cap, which is where the sill of the building stood. This is because retaining walls have more jobs to do than simply hold themselves together, which is what, uh, which is all that uh, freestanding walls have to do. Uh, they not only have to hold themselves together, but they've got to hold back any pressure that is being exerted on them uh, from the settling of the fill on the higher bank behind them. Uh, this fill, uh, uh, even if it is not disturbed uh, in the making of the wall, will tend to try to spill out into space by pushing the wall over. If you've ever seen any retaining wall, tall or short, that is leaning out away from its bank, then you're looking at a retaining wall in which that backside triangular mass was not built heavily enough to resist the push uh, from above. It is one of the few things, one of the few old techniques that has not been uh, uh, followed through uh, in contemporary building nearly as carefully uh, as it should. And this is why we have trouble uh, these days uh, with some of the retaining walls uh, that we built. When a retaining wall is a foundation, it has even more jobs to do because it not only has to hold itself together and hold back any pressure from the back side, uh, it also has to hold up, in many cases, uh, an enormous building. So it is not surprising that we find in uh, many of the antique uh, foundations that we look at uh, that huge amounts of stone have been committed uh, to the invisible parts uh, of those walls in order to make them uh, 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 last as long as they possibly can. Now, stone walls age in uh, what you might describe as reverse dog years, too. It's, very, it's a very slow process, especially uh, if the wall is, uh, is well built. Uh, but they do all come apart sooner or later. A good foundation, however, in which the building above it is maintained and keeps its roof, uh, can last for several hundred years without any serious trouble whatsoever. Uh, and uh, it's sort of a shame, isn't it, that we can't just sort of waltz into people's houses and go down into their barns uh, and look at some of these wonderful old foundations because they feature some of the finest work uh, 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 of old-fashioned New England stonework that exists. Uh, farmers uh, and others who built these walls tended to take a little bit more care with foundations than they do uh, with other kinds of walls because, as you might imagine, it is passingly difficult to repair uh, a very large stone wall when there's a huge building sitting on it. Uh, and so uh, we tend to see uh, some of the most careful uh, uh, and attractive work uh, hidden away in these foundations. Well, when the farmers began to get out of the stone wall business, uh, it appeared that uh, the craft itself would simply disappear. But in the middle of the 19th century, uh, oddly enough, we began to acquire new generations of, of uh, stone workers here uh, in New England. They were Im immigrants from other countries. Many of these countries, uh, uh, in many of these countries, stone wall building uh, and uh, other dry stone construction uh, was a recognized profession. Uh, as it was not here in the early days. I'm talking now about countries like Ireland, Italy, Finland, Greece, uh, many others. Uh, these folks began to show up uh, roughly around the time of the Irish potato famine, which began in 1847 or so. Uh, and uh, as they came to the country, uh, oddly enough, they found work. It just wasn't for the farmers. They went to work for the Railroads creating infrastructure in the forms of uh, culvert headers, bridge abutments, and so forth. And they went to work for the wealthy, uh, who in many cases were beginning to buy up some of the old farms and turn them into summer estates. They also went to work for municipalities, building uh, stone walls around things like uh, reservoirs and uh, cemeteries and so forth. These workers had a very different view of stone wall building from uh, the rough and ready work uh, of the farmers and others who assisted them. They tended to build um, uh, uh, much tighter, uh, with much flatter faces. In other words, they were much more concerned with the aesthetics of walls uh, as, um, uh, as structure, rather than uh, simply being concerned uh, with uh, using up as much stone as possible uh, and putting the structure together any way that would work uh, in any given place. And so. Uh, in order to do this, they tended to be selective about the individual stones that they used uh, and discard ones uh, that were uh, uh, not to their liking. This was a very new attitude towards stone wall building, and it was part of the shift in style away from the practical and toward the aesthetic uh, that became very pronounced in stone wall building uh, 
uh, quite, quite early on in some places, but uh, almost everywhere by the time we got uh, past the end of the 19th century and into the 20th. It even uh, began to impinge on uh, other architectural practices. Uh, you know, by then, the uh, building and use of stone, uh, stone work of all kinds had become a kind of marker of New England uh, as a place uh, and as a culture. This happened relatively early, uh, uh, in the uh, early years of the 19th century. And so uh, this uh, 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 symbolic uh, uh, way that stone walls began to be looked at really mirrored a kind of uh, change in the way that we look at architecture generally. You know, when the uh, Greek revival came along, I know you historians are uh, well aware of that, uh, we began to look at architecture as a, uh, a thing that had a, a certain symbolic value, rather than simply building something that looked well, uh, as the uh, colonial era builders did. Uh, we began to build things that reflected our, uh, our uh, admiration for the new form of government that we had invented. Uh, and so uh, the reason that we painted all our villages white and uh, began to put columns and Greek pediments uh, on our houses and so forth uh, was to honor the uh, uh, the genius of uh, the Athenians uh, and also the Romans, uh, who we uh, gave credit for inventing the uh, democratic ideal that we have now uh, imported uh, to our own country. Uh, this um, uh, attitude also uh, came into play with stonework as well. For instance, when the uh, colonial revival came around toward the end of the 19th century, we began to uh, think seriously about spiffing up our towns and cleaning up those muddy town commons and putting nice little walls around them or uh, about rebuilding some of the old antique pounds, things like that. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the symbolic value and the aesthetic value of, of stonework began to become more important than the practical value of using it for fencing. Uh, this was also true of the arts and crafts movement, which resulted in the uh, creation of the shingle style of building. Uh, uh, which uh, was a kind of anti-industrial movement in the early part of the 20th century uh, that uh, extolled the use of natural materials, especially, uh, uh, but not exclusively, uh, natural stone. So, for instance, you've ever seen a nice little cottage uh, somewhere that was built in, say, 1918 or 1923, and the knee walls and the posts, that, the pillars that hold up the front porch roof were all made of tiny little river stones all mortared together in a pattern. Uh, you're looking at a way that uh, the expectation uh, of stonework found its way into a new uh, style of architecture. Uh, this uh, sort of thing uh, really speaks to the, uh, the change in attitude towards stonework from uh, the practical to the aesthetic. Well, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to push this along a little bit more uh, for those of you who uh, just can't get enough of this. Let me give you a quick overview of some of these books uh, that I've brought. Here are two general histories of New England stone wall building. This is Sermons in Stone by Susan Alport. Uh, it is the grandmother of all uh, modern writing, current writing about stone walls, including my own. It is a social history, the who, the what, where, the why. Beautifully written, um, uh, very practical, easy read. Uh, and uh, this is where the story uh, really gets told very clearly. The second book is Stone by Stone by uh, Dr. Robert Thorson. Uh, it covers exactly the same territory as Ms. Allport's book, uh, but it does so from the standpoint of a scientist. So if you're, you prefer to see your uh, stone walls come with a lot of quantifying uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, the geological history of New England and uh, other uh, more scientific uh, approaches, uh, then that is definitely the book for you. There are approximately 500,000 books about using stone in gardens. <laughs> this is one of the better ones. It's by Gordon Hayward, who lives across the river from us in Vermont, uh, where he and his wife uh, designed gardens for a living. If you're somebody who loves the uh, contrast of uh, hardscape stonework with uh, delicate plantings, then that book is full of wonderful ideas uh, for your garden. Uh, professor Thorson, who is a geology professor at the University of Connecticut, is also responsible for this little handbook, which is a kind of thing you can carry with you on your perambulations around the countryside in case you get curious about the dates of settlement uh, of the part of the country that you're in, uh, or would like to know what sorts of moss and lichen you are looking at on the stone walls that you pass. Uh, 
uh, in your travels. Very useful for that sort of thing. This book is absolutely essential for anyone who simply likes to look uh, at old-fashioned stonework. It was written about 10 years ago by a man named William Hubble, uh, a Mainer, uh, and he has done us all the enormous favor of traveling deeply throughout New England and photographing virtually every single kind uh, of old-time dry-laid stonework uh, that can be and has been built. Uh, he also includes uh, extremely informative captions with every single photograph, but the heart of this book uh, is its pictures. There is one photograph in this that will leave absolutely no doubt in your mind how it was we acquired 250,000 miles plus of dry plate stonework. I know you can't see it from here, so I'm going to leave it open on the table uh, for any of you who would like to look more closely in a few minutes. This is a picture of a, a piece of ruined farmland in upstate New York, shot from a plane uh, right down through these leafless trees, in which the old medieval pattern of one and two and three acre fields, all in squares and rectangles, is perfectly preserved. Uh, down through these trees uh, that, of course, uh, have grown up since the, um, uh, since the walls were built. You look at this photograph and then project what you see in it over virtually every arable inch of New England and a lot of non-arable ones, too. You'll be amazed we only ended up with 250,000 miles of dry-laid stone wall. <laughs> there are two out-of-print books in my little collection. Uh, this is one of them. It is called The Rock is My Home. It was written in 1977 by a Swiss architect named Werner Glaser. It is not about New England. It's not even about America, but I had to bring it to show you, even in its wretched condition, uh, because it is one of the most spectacular books about dry laid stonework uh, ever written. It depicts um, uh, a number of uh, uh, some of the most arresting stone sites in Europe, including these uh, five and six foot sheep walls on the Aran Islands off the coast of Ireland. And these buildings in the north of Italy, again, I'm going to leave this open for you, up against the Alps, in which entire structures, walls and roof, are made of dry laid stone. How confident would you be going to sleep <laughs> of loose boulders in an earthquake-prone region? And yet entire villages are built this way. Last book in my little collection is a uh, slim volume called The Forgotten Art of Building Stone Walls. It was written in 1971 by a nice old gentleman named Curtis Fields, who retired to Heartland, Vermont, decided he um, uh, was fascinated by stonework, taught himself to do it, uh, and then, uh, out of a concern that the craft had lost its um, uh, general understanding among the public, decided to create an instruction book about it. I know this is of great interest to you. The only difficulty with Mr. Uh, uh, Fields' approach to instruction was that he himself preferred to work only with stone that was square. <laughs> so if you, if you live in a place where all the stone is square, this is a fabulous instruction. <laughs> Anybody here live in a place where all the stone is square? I didn't think so. If you live in New England, it is entirely useless as an instruction. But it has another significance that makes it interesting, and that is its publication date. You probably uh, realized that uh, by publishing it in 1971, he was exactly one century on uh, from the initial publication of the only effort that was ever made to determine how many stone walls we really had, uh, and that was, of course, the Federal Report on Fencing uh, of 1871. What's, what makes these two publications sort of bookend each other uh, is the irony of their intention versus their actual effect. The Federal Report on Fencing, which um, sets out to be a kind of celebration of everything that had been accomplished with respect to dry laid stonework up to that time, ended up being a kind of eulogy because it appeared uh, at the historical moment when we were abandoning the constant building uh, of stone walls and substituting uh, uh, bigger, more open fields uh, for them, and of course barbed wire for the cows that came along uh, to help take the place of uh, what we had lost in the sheep industry. Whereas uh, Mr. Fields' book, uh, which was a conscious eulogy for what he perceived as the loss of a valuable skill, uh, turned into something uh, of a harbinger uh, 
uh, of things to come. And that is because it appeared in 1971, right before the great um, the beginning of the great residential housing boom that has uh, uh, both um, occupied and inflicted uh, itself upon us uh, ever since with some ups and downs. That housing boom created a demand for landscape services uh, that in turn uh, has created an enormous demand for new decorative stonework. The fact is that there are more people learning this trade and practicing it today uh, than have been active in it for at least the last 100 years, uh, if not uh, more. We are in no danger whatsoever uh, of losing this craft um, uh, right now. And so uh, uh, this makes the Mr. Fields' book and uh, the Federal Report on Fencing uh, uh, unexpected Brothers. Uh, my own books, I'm going to say as little as possible. Uh, uh, as, um, uh, as John pointed out, uh, The Grand Kiss, uh, my first, uh, was published in 2001. Uh, I had great timing with this book. It came out the week after 9-11. <laughs> that was a good week to make no splash whatsoever <laughs> of any kind, except the one that had been made in New York City. Uh, but it has survived. This is a book that was written for two kinds of people. Those who would like to learn to build stone walls, and those who would not. <laughs> I thought that would cover a lot of territory. Uh, it is a book uh, that is considerably more wide-ranging uh, with respect to the subject as a whole uh, than is this one, which is now two years old. Uh, this one is aimed exclusively at people who want to teach themselves to build this. It is far more um, uh, extensively illustrated uh, than the granite kiss, but it is, uh, uh, it is also uh, uh, full of a lot of little details about what it takes to deal uh, with the obstreperous stone supply we have uh, here in New England. Well, we've now arrived at the blessed time when I ask you uh, to please tell me what it is you'd really like to know. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, are there any grants uh, to help rebuild stone walls? Are there any what? Uh, grants available to rebuild stone walls? If there are, I don't know about them. The question was, are there available grants to rebuild, uh, to help rebuild stone walls? I don't know if there are or not. My guess is no. Uh, but in order to uh, uh, get information from people who are better informed than I am about this subject, I would call the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance down in Concord uh, and ask that question to them. Uh, they might be able to tell you if there's anything uh, uh, that could even be interpreted as, as uh, support for rebuilding walls. Yes? Are you able to tell what a field was used for by looking at the stone wall that surrounds it? The question is, are you able to tell what fields were used for? You can, uh, you can make some educated guesses. I'll go that far. For instance, if you come or run across a stone wall that's extremely wide, uh, uh, and is uh, full to the brim and running over with uh, uh, stones roughly the size of a baseball, uh, something like that, you can be reasonably sure that on one side or the other of that wall the uh, field is being plowed uh, for row crops or other plantings. Uh, that is the activity that would turn up uh, a lot of that small stuff. That's right. And, and because the uh, surface of the land was, pl was uh, made naked, in other words, had, had no more root crop, either from uh, turf or from forest on it, uh, that wonderful phenomenon of the New England potato, uh, in which stones appear to rise uh, to the surface every year, uh, uh, was immediately precipitated. This is a thing that we did, by the way. It's not a natural phenomenon, particularly. It only happens under exposed pavement uh, and in garden spaces where there's no roots at all. Uh, on the surface, and it has to do with the differential between uh, the way earth and stone uh, gain and lose heat. Uh, that whole mat turns into uh, a frozen one in the winter, but when the spring comes, the dirt un uh, thaws before the stone. And that means that because the water in it has expanded, uh, it pulls away from the stone, and now there's a little space. There's a little uh, hairline crack all the way around the stone, including on the bottom. Then when it rains or the fluid in the, uh, uh, the soil uh, uh, sinks down, it carries a little soil down and deposits it in that, uh, in that little space underneath the stone. So these stones, uh, even though they still have the ambition to sink to the center of the earth, are being pushed upward. It is only natural that if there are seven and a half billion of these in your garden, that a couple of hundred of them are going to make it to the surface every year. <laughs> uh, don't worry. 
There's plenty more coming along. <laughs> now, as to uh, the other place where this uh, uh, happens, of course, is underexposed pavement. If we would only stop plowing the roads in the winter, there would be no frost heat. We need to go back to rolling them with giant rollers the way we used to do it. Um, of course, we'd have to put tracks on all our cars, uh, but that wouldn't really be that expensive, would it? <laughs> that is what causes uh, those awful frost heaps in the roads uh, in the spring. Well, let's get to it. Yes. Just a little, a little bit about it. The, what's the dynamic, of, obviously, the big dynamics of the spring thaw, the freezing, the thawing, and so on, on these stone walls, but yet they seem to resist falling down with all that. I don't believe that um, uh, frost heaps as stone wall killers, I think that's overstated. Um, uh, uh, I don't see any evidence that frost is a particular destroyer. Uh, of stone walls, in spite of what the poet Robert Frost uh, claims uh, in his famous poem, uh, Mending Wall. Um, if uh, frost heaps uh, were capable of toppling stone walls, I can't imagine it'd be one stone left on another uh, anywhere in the state, and yet they, uh, they persist uh, without too much trouble. Now, our winters have changed. Uh, the winters when these, uh, the reputation of frost uh, as a destroyer of anything uh, was made was in the early 19th century. The early 19th century was at the tail end of what uh, geologists call our little ice age, uh, when winters were considerably colder than they are now. Um, uh, uh, in 1816, for instance, uh, there was a volcanic eruption in the South Pacific which put so much ash into the air that the mean temperature of the Earth uh, plunged by a couple of degrees over the next uh, year or two. This created what is still called in, uh, in New England the year without summer, uh, in which it snowed in July, nothing would grow. Uh, it was a complete disaster uh, because of the cold. Frost really did strike deep uh, uh, back then, uh, but that is no longer the case. You go in the woods uh, in any ordinary year when we've had average uh, snowpack uh, and scrape away the snow and the, and the leaf turf. You can dig a hole right through the surface of the ground just about any time. Uh, the forest floor hardly freezes at all anymore. And this is quite different, even in terms of uh, our own lifetimes here. Um, uh, I had a wonderful conversation some years ago with a man named Tom Wessels, uh, some, a name some of you may know. He's a forest ecologist who uh, uh, teaches at Antioch uh, down in Keene. Uh, we were trying to remember, guess, when the last time it went to 30 below in the places where we live. I live in Hopkinton, which is down by Concord. The last time it went to 30 below in Hopkinton, New Hampshire was in 1982, in the winter of 82. That was it. We've ne we haven't been there since. My <coughs> uncle, who taught me uh, to do this and is now 87 years old, uh, swears that there were uh, days when he was growing up on a, a, on a farm about a mile away from where we both live now. Uh, when it went to 40 below. Uh, now, 20 below is rare. So things have been changing uh, around here uh, in terms of how frost gets generated and how much of it there is. You know, the, uh, the building trades have not caught up with this. So we're still being uh, told that we've got to uh, uh, put our foundations four feet below the frost line. Frost doesn't go in near that deep now. Not even close. We need to revisit some of our building codes. What else can I tell you? Yes? I had heard um, back in the 70s that the, there was a Stonewall builder down at Shaker Village in Canterbury who had one arm. Is that true? I don't know if it's true, but I've also heard the story. <laughs> now, <laughs> a Stonewall builder with one arm is not exceptionally useful. Um, however, I believe that. Uh, uh, I believe that this particular builder uh, was a, an older man uh, who had quite a lot of young help. Uh, one thing you can do when you only have one arm is point. Uh, and I suspect that that's what he mostly did. But I, th I think the story probably is true. Because uh, uh, I know that I've been told it by those down at the, at the village too. We've done a bunch of restoration work for them. So uh, we've had conversations with the people who run the place. Uh, yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. As I walk um, around uh, rural roads, you see uh, stone walls often in the woods and stuff. And, and I'm 
you know, you just wonder why they were there. And were they ever um, built for boundaries? And were they legally uh, recognized as boundaries? Or was it just clearing of the land? Most, uh, the vast majority of our stone walls were built for practical purposes. And uh, uh, we didn't really need to uh, wall off uh, individual properties from one another uh, in those days. Uh, so uh, my opinion um, uh, is that very few stone walls are built exclusively as boundaries. Uh, most of them were built for practical purposes of having to do with the activities of the farmer on that particular land. Um, uh, uh, boundaries typically were marked by uh, individual standing stones or uh, other uh, stones with um, some sort of mark uh, drilled into them, uh, set at the corners or at places where the where the line uh, switched directions, something like that. Um, now, many stone walls today are boundaries, but they have acquired their boundariness over time as larger uh, parcels were broken up and it became convenient. Uh, to say, well, I'm going to give this parcel to one of my sons and, and this one to somebody else, uh, uh, to another one, uh, and we'll call the boundary the stone wall at the bottom of the south field, something like that, right? Uh, so a lot of our stone walls are boundaries now, but they didn't start out that way. Uh, and it's, it's hard to come up with any real practical reasons why boundaries would have had to be uh, marked with that much labor, creating continuous walls, as long as... Uh, uh, there was a, a blaze on a tree in the right place, or the, the switches in direction were marked uh, with uh, uh, standing stones or flat ones with something carved <coughs> into them, a, a pinhole or something like that. Uh, that was enough to uh, delineate the boundaries. Yeah. Yes? You see a lot of your stone walls along roads that didn't delineate where roads are. Uh, yes, um, uh, they end up doing that, but you have to remember that when the, in the days of settlement, a lot of these places were settled out uh, when, when there were no roads at all. Uh, and the roads tended to develop uh, in response to the presence of uh, homesteads uh, or houses. Uh, you need, we've talked about this before. Um, uh, you need to remember, too, that a lot of, uh, a lot of the country roads uh, that eventually appeared uh, uh, in uh, our towns were also used by drovers to move large amounts of uh, livestock out to market, uh, especially during the, day, the sheep days. Uh, and so uh, the standard width for, a, uh, uh, for the stone walls running alongside a road was sometimes two rods, which is 32 feet, um, uh, 33 actually. Uh, uh, so, uh, but, the, but the walls themselves, uh, overwhelmingly were built by the farmers along each section uh, for their own purposes. Uh, once the road is there, of course, you want to uh, uh, keep anything that's coming down the road from wandering off into your cornfield and, and damaging it uh, in some way. So uh, uh, in addition to uh, marking the road, uh, those roadside walls also prevented uh, traffic from spilling over into uh, land that was being used on the other side of the wall. Right here. Uh, you mentioned two rods. I don't hear that very often when I'm reading my uh, surveys. I call it three rod or four rod marked down. Hmm. Uh, you got a generous town. <laughs> I'm just curious. You know, I never heard of two. Where, where would I find a two rod rod? In your area? Of, of I guess state? so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's 30 feet. That's a that's a pretty decent stretch. Two wagons can get by each other. And yeah, a rod is 17 feet. Yeah, that's 16 and a half, but yeah. it's equivalent. <laughs> um, uh, certainly there are, uh, there were uh, some that, were, that went wider than that. Yes? Uh, a lot of times a uh, wall is a single stack stone. Yes. And then there'll be a section of double stack to yep. what you're building. That's right. Is there any significance to that other than just trying to get rid of that? You know, you would, you would think this single stack thing is, uh, uh, is mysterious. Uh, a single stack wall is a, a version of the freestanding wall, but it's only one stone thick. Um, uh, this, uh, we see thousands of miles of this. Now, why, in a place where one of your ancillary goals, uh, building any, anything out of stones, use as much stone as possible, would you ever build in a style that uses the least amount of stone uh, necessary to make a barrier? The answer is speed. 
it is possible for crews that know what they're doing and have ready access to stone to go dozens of feet, not, not 10, not 15, dozens of feet of this type in a day. Uh, and that meant it was ideal for sheep uh, when so much wool had to be uh, uh, built so quickly. Uh, as far as um, uh, running along the side of a road to prevent other uh, uh, animals moving up and down the road from uh, coming into your field, it was also uh, an excellent uh, and very fast uh, way to put a wall up. Why it uh, might run along single for a while and then turn to a double one might have something to do with uh, a, a change in ownership at the point where the wall changes so that the preference of the farmer on the other side um, uh, ran to double. Uh, it may be that uh, they wanted to uh, lose a little bit more stone in the place where the wall was thicker and so they, uh, uh, so they built enough, uh, they built their walls uh, wide enough to accept uh, as much stone as they could put there. It's always very hard to tell precisely what uh, happened in a given place just by uh, what's left of the stonework there. It's a little bit like trying to guess uh, what somebody's preferences in clothing were uh, by looking at the soles of her shoes. You know, uh, there's just not enough information and so many of the features of the old landscape have disappeared now. One of the things that's very important to imagine though, look at old stone walls out in the countryside to try and take the trees out of your field of vision. It is really difficult to explain to people how different this landscape was 175 or so years ago. It was virtually treeless in many, many places. Now we have visitors come up here from elsewhere in the country and one of the first questions they ask is, why did they build all these walls in the woods? You tell them that the walls are older than the woods, uh, they don't believe you. <laughs> There's a story about the guys in, uh, you know where Jaffrey is? The town of Jaffrey is? story about the guys in Jaffrey who were building their meeting house one uh, uh, day in 1776. Um, uh, if you've been down in Jaffrey, you know the, the old meeting house is on the top of the hill where the old village center is. Uh, it's still standing there. Apparently, these guys, as they were framing the roof of that meeting house, uh, were able to look across a landscape that was so wide open and flat uh, with respect to forest that they could hear and see the smoke and the cannon fire and the battle of Bunker Hill in Boston, 80 miles away. If you stand on the second floor of that meeting house today and look east, you see a wall of trees. This was a different world from the one we're in now. It was a world that looked a lot like uh, major sections of the countryside in England, uh, with a, uh, a little villages tucked in here and there, uh, roads connecting them, uh, the odd woodlot, uh, uh, but no sustained forest whatsoever, uh, and a huge patchwork of open fields, uh, all bound in by uh, stone walls. Uh, absolutely uh, stunning sight, but a world that it bears no resemblance whatsoever uh, to the landscape that we are uh, living in now. John's going to kick us out now. <laughs> so, I'm going to say to you, I'm not going anywhere. If you have other questions, come on up. You can see the mess I've made, but let me just say to you, Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.